Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your social media feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Vivi Ganeshananthan, also known as Sugi, the author of the novel Brotherless Night. And I'm Whitney Terrell, the author of the novel The Good Lieutenant. And the Chiefs just won the Super Bowl. Wasn't that like a couple of weeks ago? I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you saying there's a time limit on how long I'm allowed to be happy about my hometown team winning the Super Bowl for the second time? Yes. In four years. Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. People in Vikings country <laughs> don't need this. Well, they should be jealous. We beat them to win our first Super Bowl way back in 1970 when I was three. But recently, it just sort of seems to me like your team is always winning the Super Bowl or at least getting close. That is true. And we have won three. We've been to three Super Bowls in four years, won two of them. And do you want to know why? I do. Actually Everyone in, the, in America is saying like, no, we don't want to know why. Shut <laughs> up, Whitney. I do actually know why. Even though I am not anything close to being a serious football fan, it's because you have a really, really, really good quarterback. We have a great quarterback. We have a transcendent quarterback. We have the Michael Jordan of quarterbacks. And his name is Patrick Mahomes. That's correct. Um, we just had a gigantic parade here for him and all of his teammates, Travis Kelsey, Juju Smith-Schuster, Isaiah Pacheco, Chris Jones, Mark Esvaldis, Scantling, Creed Humphrey, Sky Moore, Orlando Brown. I could go on. Please don't. Um, okay, so I have a question. You've spent a lot of your writing career writing about the history of racial segregation in Kansas City, yet here you have this football team that is incredibly popular and presumably has a number of Black players, including the aforesaid Patrick Mahomes. How has that team and those Black players interacted with the city over all these years? That is a good question. Wouldn't it be fantastic if someone had written a book about that and about how one of the world's most famous athletes also fits into the racial history of a very typically American, Midwest, American Midwestern city like Kansas City? It would be. I'd say that I would read that book, except that I just did. It's called Kingdom Quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, the Kansas City Chiefs, and how a once swinging cow town chased the ultimate comeback. And it's by Mark Dent and Rustin Dodd, who are joining us today. That's right. Mark, who's sitting right here next to me, although you can't see that on the audio, um, is a journalist based in Dallas and Kansas City, where he's from. Uh, his work has been published in the New York Times, Texas Monthly, Vox, GQ, Wired, Slate, Fortune, Vice, Runner's World, one of my favorites, the Kansas City Star, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, welcome, Mark. Hey, thanks for having me. And Rustin Dodd. Rustin is a senior writer at The Athletic. He previously worked as a sports writer at the Kansas City Star from 2010 to 2017. His work has been honored by the Associated Press Sports Editors, and he's a graduate of the University of Kansas. Welcome, Rustin. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. So first of all, both of you are or have been in the past, I guess this is both past tense for you now, Kansas City residents. Can you talk about your early connections to the Chiefs? Russ, I remember hearing you on the radio. Um, for most of my life, the Chiefs were, I don't know, mid would be what my son would say. <laughs> you know, like they really sucked in the in the late 70s and early 80s. And then they kind of got better when Schottenheiner came to town. But they never really were winners. You know, they weren't great. What does it feel like for them to be a national and like international sensation now? It's it's quite shocking, actually. You know, Mark and I both grew up in the suburbs of Kansas City, uh, Overland Park, to be exact. Uh, and we're uh, the same age. So we really don't have much memory of like the 70s and 80s Chiefs, which were were quite bad. But the the 90s Chiefs were of like the kind of good, but they will always broke your heart variety. Um, so those were sort of the Chiefs we knew, the Chiefs that, you know, made the playoffs a few times here or there, but always lost at home in the first round. Um, and so, yeah, just, usually to the Colts. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the, yeah, to the Colts or whoever, the Denver. Steelers, or whoever, yeah. Um, so, uh, those, you know, the Chiefs always felt like, um, you know, they weren't inept, uh, although, you know, sometimes they were, but they, they just were never good enough, uh, which felt, um, I don't know, I, you know, we talked about this as we were doing the book, but it, it kind of felt like a, a theme of Kansas City as we were growing up, um, too. You know, it was a city that was, you know, had its, uh, had its, you know, positives, but it just never felt quite good enough. Um, and so that, that's kind of, you know, that was my connection to the Chiefs. 
Yeah, I, I think there like was this sense of where uh, just like how the Chiefs could never go on to to really win the big game uh, to to make it to. I mean, they couldn't even make it to the conference finals for the most part, I think, except for one time uh, when when Joe Montana was there in the very early 90s. Um, so it, it just kind of seemed that Kansas City felt to be the same way where it was like you wondered. A, uh, the Chiefs, they're never going to, it'll never happen that the, that they'll win a Super Bowl or even that they'll go to one. And then it was this, you know, you wondered about Kansas City, like, is it, can it make this uh, leap or just sort of be the city that it needs to be? Because everybody loved Kansas City, though, too, uh, just like how everybody loved the Chiefs. And, and yet it was sometimes it felt like the, the love wasn't always returned, I guess. There was this, the story of being a Chiefs fan was the story of missed opportunities. You know, this field goal wasn't, it wasn't made or we had, we didn't manage to get the other team to punt in this game. You know, these are all, there's the string of tragedies, right? Rather than actual final success. No, no doubt. And I think we are glossing over a, a major thing was that they never had a quarterback, which was sort yeah. of the major theme. Uh, and also obviously why our, our book is called kingdom quarterback, but, uh, but yeah, they, they were this, team where for 20 years they found their quarterbacks with the backups of other teams and that almost quite literally is what they did you know they would find a 49ers backup or a Patriots backup and they would uh hope that he was good enough and and generally speaking uh he was they could be okay but um never quite good enough and well and now this is Mark and I mean meanwhile the teams that were defeating the Chiefs in the playoffs all those years uh, they a lot of times had these kind of franchise quarterbacks who who had been drafted and grown into like these kind of like heroes of of that city. Uh, Dan Marino especially comes to mind. And while he never won the Super Bowl in Miami, he did beat the Chiefs twice in two really depressing games in the 1990s in the playoffs. Um, later on, uh, when in, on Andy Reid's first teams, when Alex Smith was the quarterback, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, beat the Chiefs in Arrowhead when they had Ben Roethlisberger. The Chiefs were favored to win that game, uh, but the Chiefs offense did nothing. Um, and Ben Roethlisberger did just enough for the Steelers. And during this period of the wilderness, the only quarterback that we drafted, I mean, Len Dawson was obviously our first great quarterback who did win the Super Bowl, but then the only person we drafted was Todd Blackledge, who was in a great quarterback class, but he was not one of them. No, so, the only quarterback they took in the first round for, for 25 years. Um, so I was really interested to read about how Kansas City's owner and founder, Lamar Hunt, hired Black players from HBCU institutions to play for the team when other teams weren't doing that. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that happened and what his motivation was. Yeah, this is this is Rustin. Um, and so this the story starts with Lamar Hunt obviously was uh, the founder of the American Football League in the in 1960. So the American Football League, very famous story, uh, sort of this upstart league that takes on the National Football League, which was the old establishment, the institution, you know, based in New York. Um, Lamar Hunt was from Texas, so he wants to become an NFL owner. Uh, they deny, you know, his, um, you know, uh, they don't let him basically have a team. So he in a finds a bunch of billionaires to uh, to start a new league, the AFL. Um, and so one of the things that the AFL had to do was that they had to find, um, you know, market inefficiencies. They had to find ways to, um, you know, be creative. Um, and Lamar Hunt, um, one of the first things he found was that the National Football League was, you know, historically had not, um, you know, recruited, drafted, you know, really emphasized uh, black players. And there were many obvious reasons for that, many of them racial. Um, and, you know, college football obviously had its own history of racism. Most of the players from the major conferences um, you know, tended to be white. That's the players that went to the NFL. There's a there was a history of kind of quota systems in the NFL, where they would teams would only have a certain amount of black players, um, and so most of a lot of talented black players, especially from the South, found themselves at HBCUs um, in programs that really got zero media coverage. Um, and so Lamar Hunt and you know thought as they were starting this league you know there's you know dozens you know potentially hundreds of really talented black players who are not getting an opportunity to play in the nfl and this is sort of an untapped market um you know lamar hunt interesting i mean he, he's obviously a, a son of a billionaire from texas one of the you know the richest families in the country 
you know, ironically, the Hunt family, you know, has a quite a big history of being a, you know, big into conservative politics and big, you know, conservative donors and big Republicans, especially back at that time uh, in the 60s and 70s. Um, so you had this sort of, you know, Republic, you know, establishment Republican guy in the 1960s, but found that, hey, this is, you know, the best for business is, you know, to go out and find these black players at, uh, you know, Prairie View A&M or Grambling or, you know, the various places. And so, you know, if you talk to the chiefs of that time, um, it's it's sort of an interesting story because I, I think Lamar Hunt essentially was motivated by uh, by business, right? Um, but if you if you talk to the players that they ended up drafting, Willie Lanier, um, Buck Buchanan, um, a, a number of other players, Otis Taylor was a great wide receiver. He came from Prairie View A and M. Um, if you talk to these players, you know they say, you know, he Lamar Hunt was a very enlightened uh, man. I think Willie Lanier's quote was that, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to get this directly right, so I'm paraphrasing, but that Lamar Hunt was the most enlightened white man <laughs> that he'd ever met at the time. Um, so it was kind of a, an interesting story with a little bit of nuance where a lot of the motivation was, you know, financial business, uh, that there was this, you know, these market forces that were coming to play that, you know, made them want to go out and recruit black players from black colleges. But um, it also, you know, made the Chiefs kind of a, a pioneering team at the time. There are parallels between that team, which was constructed in the late 60s, um, you know, uh, they played in the first Super Bowl, as we mentioned, in 1967 against the Packers. They won Super Bowl four in 1970 against Sugi's poor Minnesota Vikings. I'm pegging, I'm tagging Sugi with the Minnesota Vikings, although she actually grew up in the Washington area and, and cheered for a team whose name we didn't used to be able to say. Um, so they're also, they were, you know, look, that team was incredibly popular and there are parallels between the, the team today and, and the team uh, then. Um, but Mark, I wonder if you could talk about the fact that these players, Bobby Bell, as we've mentioned, Buck Buchanan, Otis Taylor, Will Lanier, Bobby Bell and Will, Willie Lanier are, are on my Madden team right now playing linebacker. Um, you know, but they they couldn't buy houses in certain parts of the Kansas City. I wonder if you could talk about that and then maybe read a section from the book. When those players came to town in 1963, Kansas City hadn't even passed like a public accommodations act yet. Uh, that that happened later in the year. Um, so when, well, what when is, they, wait, explain what oh, a public yeah, accommodations so, act is. So at, at that it. time, when, when the chiefs were coming to town in 1963, um, there were still a lot of restaurants, a lot of bars, uh, that they wouldn't serve black people or they would, uh, have special sections, uh, for them and, and things like that. Uh, it was that basically was still a Jim Crow situation in, in some ways. And, and there were still department stores where, uh, maybe you could shop there, but like, there'd be like a cafeteria in there that would be segregated, things like that. And so, uh, the Kansas City's Black community had really uh, been protesting these for uh, the years before that. And then the Chiefs came to town, and in in some ways, uh, they they came right in, and ex they experienced this. Uh, there's a detail that um, another author named Michael McCambridge, who's written about the Chiefs before, found that they were going out to get drinks, uh, some of them um, when they were just visiting Kansas City. And I think uh, H. Joe Bartle was even going to meet them there, the mayor. And uh, when it was just those Black players, uh, they were not being served um, at this establishment. And so they found that out very quickly. And then when they went to look for housing, uh, this kind of these, when they went to look for housing, they were turned down. Um, Mike Garrett, who I spoke to, was the Heisman Trophy winner coming out of the University of Southern California. Uh, he grew up in Los Angeles, so he lived there all his life. And uh, he didn't really know anything about Kansas City. Like he told me he literally just knew the song, uh, you know, the, the famous <laughs> Kansas City by Lieber and Stoller. And uh, his friends on the team had kind of warned him like, hey, like uh, there's still going to be like, you know, horses and buggies and all this. And and when Garrett visited, he actually really liked Kansas City at first. And and he uh, he stayed at the Mulebach Hotel. They put him up in a room and he liked it. Um, and he heard like a, that a great place to live was the Country Club Plaza, which was sort of like this uh, shopping center with some apartments around it that is, uh, you know, very luxury type of housing and uh, really nice stores and things like that. And it was developed by J.C. Nichols, um, the famous developer of Kansas City. And uh, when he went to look for apartments, uh, he was turned down everywhere he looked um, because he was black. And he was not expecting that, frankly. Like he uh, he was expecting, as he told me, Kansas City to be more progressive than that. 
so he did end up finding an, an apartment, but he had to live uh, on this major dividing line uh, of Kansas City back then and still today, which is Troost Avenue. And so he had to live a few blocks to the east of there um, near the old uh, high school called uh, Paseo High School. And which is not very far from where we're sitting right now. Um, you should. Can you read that section from the book? Yeah. I mean, it's really great. Yeah. OK. Um, Black Kansas Cityans had won many harder advancements the previous 20 years. One day in 1950, four black men in an act of athletic disobedience quietly teed off on Swope Park's whites only golf course, setting off a cascade of black players who came over the next few months, pushing ahead as white golfers slashed their tires in the parking lot. Around the same time, Thurgood Marshall litigated the integration of Swope Park's public swimming pool. Downtown, some of the most prominent department stores declined to let black customers in their cafeterias until protesters picketed on their sidewalks for several weeks in the, in the winter of 1959, braving temperatures as low as seven degrees and snowfall totals as high as 10 inches. Their boycott was covered extensively by Lucille Bluford, who both chronicled the civil rights movement and initiated change in Kansas City after taking over as the call's editor after Roy Wilkins, shaming other media outlets into reporting on the black community. The summer of 1963, the year Hunt brought the Chiefs to town, was another turning point. The city had witnessed protests at stores and amusement parks and heard public pressure from black leaders like Bluford, Bruce Watkins, and Alvin Brooks. But when black football players started being denied service at restaurants as they filtered in town for the Chiefs' first training camp, for the first training camp, that was a final straw. Kansas City's council passed an ordinance barring discrimination at most public places. Plenty of restaurants still weren't welcoming, and the Black community had to hold off a John Birch Society-led referendum of the ordinance, but changes were noticeable. Garrett would go to the plaza for steaks at Plaza 3 and indulge, nearly nightly, at the district's Baskin Robbins. But housing was still a different story. Not even Chiefs players could penetrate the truced wall. Bobby Bell, already a homeowner in Minnesota, wanted a house in that great wonderland of Americana, a nickel suburb. He looked at some 200 houses in the mid-1960s, always without success. A realtor would notify Bell the house he wanted had just been sold, or a banker pressured to bar Black people by a subdivision's residence would refuse to underwrite the mortgage. The assistance of Hank Stram, who lived in Prairie Village and made calls on Bell's behalf, had no impact. Bell later recalled that being a football star didn't make any difference. Quote, if you were Black, you didn't need to be out there. That was the thinking of the people. Garrett shared the backfield with Curtis McClinton, a University of Kansas graduate who regularly visited 18th and Vine during college, soaking in the neighborhood's final years before the clubs were raised. McClinton scored the Chiefs' first ever touchdown in the preseason in 1963 on a 73-yard run. At the time, he was living in a one-bedroom basement apartment that rented for $7 a week. He, quote, I had to ask myself, what is the problem? Why can't I find a place to stay? And it boiled down to the fact that I represented the Black element. The situation shocked McClinton. He wondered how Kansas City could attract talented Black professionals of any occupation if it kept refusing to invest on the east side and integrate neighborhoods west of Troost. He knew the Chiefs, despite their reputation for scouting and developing the best Black players in the country, were being undermined by the city. Future Hall of Famer Gail Sayers, who, like McClinton, grew up in Wichita and started at the University of Kansas, was drafted in 1964 by the Chiefs in the AFL and the Chicago Bears in the NFL. The Bears were a middle-of-the-pack team headed nowhere, and everybody knew the Chiefs were loaded. Yet Sayers picked Chicago. A few months later, McClinton shared one of the reasons why. Quote, he knew Kansas City. He knew what the housing situation was. That one story about Sayers just killed me. I didn't know that he could have been on the Chiefs. That's awful. Yeah, and the, the really interesting thing is that... Um, uh, this, these stories about McClinton, uh, he told all of this to the Kansas City Star and, and the Kansas City Times. Um, this was all very much in the, the public record of, of the day um, at, at that time. And uh, McClinton uh, went on to, when, when he was denied that housing, so he just, he just really wanted to find an apartment. He was a young single guy. Um, so he ended up after that first year of, of just really kind of having some tough housing situations, he was able to buy a house uh, but he was like, I don't need one. Like he didn't want a house. He just wanted an apartment. And and there were just almost no quality apartments that were integrated. And so he uh, he tried to develop his own apartment. And he got the backing of players like Bobby Bell, 
um, and some other Chiefs, as, as well as a, a Kansas City A's pitcher. And uh, so they had the backing, uh, they had the plan, they were going to build it fairly close to Swope Park, uh, but it was denied by city council um, over supposed zoning issues. And so McClinton just, he joined this uh, local civil rights group called Freedom Inc. And he was really part of the fight uh, that that helped lead Kansas City into passing its first Fair Housing Act in 1967, which was about six months after they uh, played in that first Super Bowl. So the interesting thing is that so Kansas City didn't used to be this segregated. And your book points out that in the 1880s, the city was mostly integrated, which I was really interested to read. And that doesn't mean, of course, that there wasn't serious racial strife or oppression, but Black people were living in every census-designated neighborhood. They shopped at local stores and they stayed in local hotels. So how did we get from there to what you're describing? Well, Kansas City, it was like a lot of other cities at that time had had kind of similar things going on where uh, there there was like more integration than, than you would expect uh, at that time. And uh, what happened was fairly complicated, but in starting in the 1900s, um, a lot of the sort of like gains that had been made during the restru- reconstruction uh, era, those started to just be kind of like pulled back. And a lot of it was just politically oriented, where you had different political parties um, and different factions within those political parties trying to sort of gain power. And so there was kind of like this uh, uh, sort of proxy kind of battle to sort of make, um, to sort of like redraw these racial lines and 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 things like that. But then on the other side, you, you had developers um, who both kind of reflected the attitudes of the times, which is where people were beginning to um, not want to live. If, if they were white, they were not wanting to live near Black residents. And so these developers like J.C. Nichols, um, who I brought up earlier, they they had that same attitude, and yet they also kind of built on it. They reinforced it because then they started to build these housing developments uh, using um, racially restrictive covenants that effectively barred uh, Black Kansas Cityans from living in uh, certain parts of the city. And uh, and then they kind of started to build into the suburbs where they had those same covenants there. And so they kind of made um, a good portion of the city off limits to uh, Black residents. And, um, you know, a lot of these neighborhoods were very wealthy neighborhoods, like very expensive houses, but not all of them. Um, A lot of these developments were just middle class. um, Like the house that we're in um, was, you know, this is, uh, this is something that I've written about, and and I talked to you. You guys talked to me uh, about the you know for your book. Um, the Nichols Co- Covenants are this crucial. Way, re- that's why Troost, as you guys mentioned, is a racial dividing line because east of Troost were uh, houses that were developed by other people than Nichols, and west of Troost were Nichols neighborhoods that used homeowners associations to reinforce complicated racial covenants that stayed on the books longer than um, other racial covenants. And to be specific, these covenants said you cannot, this house can't be rented or owned, this property can't be rented or to or owned by anyone who's black, right? They were very explicit. Um, Rustin, uh, you know, you talk, you guys do a great job in the book about weaving this history in and connecting it to the Kansas City Chiefs. But I wonder how you grew up around here in a, I don't think it was a Nichols neighborhood, but a neighborhood that was patterned after the Nichols, you know, developments. Um, how were aware were you of the way racial covenants work in the city when you were growing up and when did you learn about them? You know, it's a good question. I was thinking about this. Um, I think the first time I was aware of J.C. Nichols as a person was when I was a kid and I would drive through Prairie Village, which is one of you know his main uh, kind of more like middle class suburbs on the Kansas side. And there would be, you know, signs for the subdivision and his name would be on it. It would, you know, it would say, I don't know if it said a JC Nichols neighborhood or a Nichols company neighborhood. And I remember that was the first time I think I was aware of the name. And then I'm most, most kids who grow up in Kansas city then are familiar. They become familiar with the story of the country club Plaza being, you know, the, you know, quote unquote, the first outdoor, you know, shopping center for cars in America. And you, you become familiar with that story and you find out JC Nichols developed that. But I will be honest, I, I don't recall understanding, uh, you know, the uh, the racial really restrictive covenant part of the story until uh, potentially I was in high school or college. So 
you know, we were talking about the early 2000s into, you know, the late 2000s, you know, I, I don't recall, you know, and I, I could be wrong about this, but I don't recall being taught this in my public high school in <laughs> urban Kansas City. Um, you know, I think you become aware of that the city is uh, really segregated and truce is the dividing line. Um, but I don't think we were taught the systematic kind of way that it became that way, uh, you know, in high school. And I, I think, um, you know, as I got into high school and early college years, it's probably the first time I really became aware of that. So we're talking, you know, mid to late 2000s. Yeah, The King of Kings County is the book that I wrote that was about that. And I that came out in 2005. There was a book that came out right before that called Race, Real Estate and Uneven Development, which was a nonfiction book that was also very good. I think those were the first books that were really talked about this. I remember I had an aunt on my mom's side of the family who showed me the covenant in in her uh, on her house, which was just in Pra which was in Prairie Village, actually. Uh, because I was asking her, why do so few people live downtown? <laughs> you know, and why did everyone move out in the suburbs? And she's like, This is why. And I was like, Oh my God, that is why. But no one had ever said that to me before or shown that to me. Mark, did you have any awareness of this growing up? I, I I did not, and obviously growing up in in, in the same areas that uh, Rustin did, I don't remember anything uh, being taught about that in in school. Um, of a lot of the people that we've interviewed, you know, people who grew up uh, both on the east side of the dividing line of Troost Avenue, and and those who grew up west or in the suburbs, uh, they didn't either. It was like I I think people noticed these sort of patterns of segregation, and you certainly noticed it more on the east side, especially that there was a lack of resources on that side as well. But the actual story of how it got that way was something that was, uh, you know, much less, um, much less talked about, much less discussed. And so, um, you know, one person I remember talking to who's around our age about, I think, in his early 30s or late 20s right now, and uh, he, he uh, lived a few blocks east of Troost. He had a lot of family that lived in Mission, Kansas. And it was just like, in some ways, a different world on both sides of there. But it wasn't until he went to UMKC and I think had a class where they taught Kevin Fox Gotham's book uh, that he learned anything about it. Um, I will say this. There was one person who I did interview. That's the book um, Race, Real Estate and Uneven Development. That's the author of that book. Yeah. yeah and there's one person I interviewed um, who's a pastor here in town, uh, Ron Lindsay. And uh, so he grew up in like the 60s and the 70s and went to Kansas City Public High Schools. And he says he did learn about J.C. Nichols back then. Um, so there may have been a time that uh, it was um, a little bit more standard to learn a little bit more about this, but uh, certainly not uh, in the last uh, generation or so. So the great Chiefs players from the 60s and 70s, like Mike Garrett and Otis Taylor and Buck Buchanan and Bobby Bell and Willie Lanier. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> all hallowed names in Whitney's house growing up. Um, these players were not able to change the racial realities of Kansas City, of course. Um, so what about Patrick Mahomes 50 years later? How does he connect to this story? One, maybe one quick thing to add to that is that uh, in some ways they they faced, uh, you know, people like Bobby Bell, uh, Mike Garrett and, and Curtis McClinton. They they did run into these housing problems when, when they first got here. But, you know, McClinton, again, uh, he worked, uh, he fought for it and changes were made. Um, they didn't come easy. Uh, but McClinton and a lot of other black leaders uh, fought hard and, and they got much better housing situations uh, than what those players had when they first got here. And Bobby Bell, he did end up getting his house in Prairie Village. It took him forever. It took him five years and a lot of things to go right before he got it. And then he encouraged some of his teammates to move out there. And so they, they by being there, uh, and this is especially what Mike Garrett told me, he felt that like the Chiefs did change people's attitudes and um, whether, and it was obviously long overdue. And there was a lot of other things going on at the same time that helped change those attitudes as well. But the those Chiefs, um, they ended up changing Kansas City a little bit with uh, being in the city, with winning that Super Bowl. Um, and I, I think that Patrick Mahomes today, uh, he's here in a much different time. Yeah, Russ, and I wonder, you know, he, Mahomes lives or has lived uh, over in the Sunset, is it the Sunset Hill neighborhood? Is it Sunset Drive? Is that the actual street? I think it's where, it's where I have Alton Atchison, the real estate developer in the King of Kings County lives there too, in, in my imagination. So that was a Nichols neighborhood that he lives in now. He plays golf at Mission Hills, which was news to me that, that your book told me. 
Um, you know, so he hasn't had that same different that same difficulty. But is he go, is he? Do you view him as a potentially unifying figure in that way? Yeah, well, I think one of the things we write about in the book um, is the history of the quarterback position, right? Which was also, uh, you know, greatly restricted to to talented black players for decades. Um, you know, uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, there were very, very few black quarterbacks in the NFL for for many reasons, but most of them, you know, stereotypes, racial attitudes, the idea that you know, black players couldn't lead a team. Um, in most of those, you know, um, you know, attitudes have, have disappeared in the last few decades. Uh, but Patrick Mahomes is now probably, you know, and you could argue this, but I think it's true that he is the first time that a black quarterback is the unquestioned best player in the NFL. Um, so it's really sort of, you know, heralded in a new era of, of the NFL and uh, for the black quarterback and for football. And so I think, just by his existence, he is sort of a change agent in that way. Um, and I think he's come along in Kansas City at a time uh, when Kansas City has sort of reflected and started to consider these things that they never considered before. Um, so I, I think, you know, Patrick Mahomes, just by his existence, just by um, being here in Kansas City, um, I think he's added to the conversation that has, you know, been happening you know, for the last 10 years, but also, you know, really came to the forefront in the last few years as, you know, the the country started to reckon with some of these questions and some of these ideas of uh, real estate and the history and uh, J.C. Nichols have become more a part of the conversation. Um, so I think, you know, there's, you know, specific things that Patrick Mahomes has done, right? He's, he pushed uh, Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL during the the summer of uh, protests in 2020 uh, to say Black Lives Matter. And, you know, the NFL had its own, you know, kind of questionable history with race over the last few years involving Colin Kaepernick and, and Black put it mildly. Kaepernick. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and at the time there was, you know, people in the league who said, you know, if Patrick Mahomes wasn't, you know, part of that player driven push to push the league, the league would have not been so quick to act, but he was he was part of that player driven push to get the league to really, um, you know, consider it's uh, the way it was, um, you know, treating racial issues. Um, so he, he has done specific things like that. But I think just as much, um, you know, his the the level that he's played at in his kind of existence, he lives in a J.C. Nichols neighborhood. Um, it, it really has added, I think, um, both you know, I, I, you know, you could argue both a unifying figure, but also sort of um, a change agent just by um, just by his, you know, arrival in Kansas City. Is there something particular about Patrick Mahomes upbringing or his personality that allows him to be that unifying figure slash change agent that you're talking about? Or, or, yeah, I mean, is there is there something sort of about his character that you think makes that possible? Mark. Yeah, I I think that I think that for one thing, you know, Patrick Mahomes, he comes from uh East Texas, like this, you know, uh, fairly small town uh called White House, uh just outside of Tyler. Um, you know, he's he's the son of a black father and a white mother. So he comes from a mixed race background. And both sides of the family were uh they were involved. Uh they were at his games when he was growing up. Um, you know. Uh, Mahomes' grandfather told me uh, that he kept in really good touch. His parents did divorce, but Mahomes' grandfather uh, stayed pretty close with uh, the grandparents on his mom's side. And, and those families kind of interacted. And so he kind of has this mixed race background. And he was also, uh, he had this, he had a, a fairly good childhood growing up to where he was the, you know, as the son of a star athlete, he was known as a star athlete um, amongst um, this kind of really sports mad East Texas kind of area. So he always had uh, some really good advantages growing up in that sense. And, and he's talked about those, like he didn't face uh, or really see a whole lot of racial injustice because of the position that he was in. And I think that that kind of allowed him to kind of have developed this personality of where he just really like, um, I, I think when he he says things uh, of, of how much that he like accepts, uh, you know, the white side of his family, the black side of his family. And I think that he kind of means that like he's, uh, he 
uh, sorry, I'm starting to ramble here. I'm trying to think if I can go. Um, well, there's over. a point in the book where he says specifically, and I wrote this down, and it was an interesting thing for for him to say or uh, maybe admit, you know, is he said, I was never put in a situation where I felt like I was not getting the same privileges as someone else. Um, that's a rare thing to say for a uh, young black male in, um, in American society, you know. Uh, Rustin, I, I wonder how you feel like that uh, affects the way that he presents himself. Yeah, well, you know, one of his uh, uh, Little League coaches uh, and um, and when he was talking, Mark was talking about the way, you know, Patrick's upbringing was, you know, it was, it was sort of... Uh, like a, a many different worlds and I'm, I'm not just speaking racially you know he was the son of a, a major league pitcher but he also was raised uh, fairly modestly um you know he spent most of the time with his his mother who was a single mom who worked you know extra hours to um you know make sure that he could play you know basketball or baseball his father was a you know a relief pitcher in the major leagues for many years so he had the status of a you know a big league player and was a you know a a local celebrity in Tyler, Texas, but not necessarily, you know, a generally or generationally wealthy person after, you know, 10 years as just a sort of a middle relief pitcher. So, you know, Patrick had sort of um, a childhood where he was known in the, in the community that he grew up in. Everybody knew his family. It was kind of a small, smaller town. Um, but he also kind of came from a typical sort of, uh, you know, middle-class background. He was not the, you know, the rich kid of a, of a former athlete or anything like that. But one of his, as I was saying, one of his little league coaches said, you know, we all kind of treated him as a treasure. Um, you know, this kid was, <laughs> they just sort of a, you know, from the time he was young, everybody just sort of assumed he was going to be a professional athlete, both because of his uh, father, but also because just he was a, a you know kind of a prodigy in, in all the sports he played. Um, so I think he just sort of had um, a really good pers a childhood that gave him a really good perspective. You know, he had these advantages that many children did not have. He didn't face uh, the way he says it. You know, a lot of uh, racism growing up in in East Texas, but he also I think ha you know had a relatively normal childhood in the sense of, uh, you know, he wasn't, uh, you know, jetting around the country or anything with, uh, you know, a, a millionaire father or anything like that. I think he, he came from a, a fairly middle class uh, experience in, in White House. And though people knew, I, I did enjoy reading in the book where that people knew that he was going to be a good athlete, but they didn't know he was going to be a quarterback originally. And his dad wanted him to play baseball. And the first couple, like, I think he goes to a camp where he's supposed to be working out and they put him at safety and, it, you know, he didn't, he didn't even play quarterback on his high school team right away. I wondered if you could, so there were, you know, the, his path to becoming the greatest quarterback in the history of football, which is what I think he is, was not laid out for him. No. And I mean, and you could argue though, that his, his background, you know, athletically is, is exactly what's allowed him to become the quarterback that he's become, you know, he grew up playing uh, baseball, obviously his, his father had that background. He played, you know, travel baseball uh, in the summers with, you know, those sort of teams. Um, he loved basketball. You know, many people say that that was sort of his first love, um, you know, that he, that was the sport he really loved, you know, maybe potentially more than even uh, baseball, but Football was sort of a thing that he played kind of on the side, mostly because his friends played it. And he, you know, loved hanging out with the same kids that he played baseball and basketball with. Um, it wasn't until his junior year of high school that he even became a starting quarterback. Um, and that was when he really kind of fell for football and realized he had a talent for it. Um, but yeah, I think he, all of those skills, if you watch him play quarterback, um, you see, you know, the, the, the arm angles on his throws, the sidearm throws, the creativity, he looks like he's playing shortstop. And then occasionally he's on the run and he will do a, some sort of play where it's a little improvisation and he'll flip the ball to a receiver and it looks like he's playing basketball. And, and it's, you know, quite literally, you can see the skills that he attained playing all these sports. And, you know, I, a lot of, kids grow up playing three sports and there's the, you know, stereotype of the, the quarterback of the football team and the point guard on the basketball team. So that, that is a familiar story, but for whatever reason, Patrick seemed to really have these genetic kind of gifts and these athletic gifts 
um, to where once he collected all of these, um, you know, tools from other sports, he was able to kind of play quarterback like nobody had before. And I don't know that we've really talked about this, but some of what we're, and for those of our listeners who might not be, I don't know, football nerds. We are after right? all like, a literary and political podcast. We are, so we there's are a very football, potentially non-football watchers on, possibly. on who listen to the show. And if you stayed with Maybe. us this long, I support and celebrate you. But like Actually, right, probably we have the lowest percentage of football watchers that you could possibly find for a podcast would be my well, guess. Well, so it might be worth mentioning that, right? Like the the position of quarterback, like there have just been very few black quarterbacks in the NFL, period, right? And this is about like also the racialization of that position, period. And like the idea of it as like the smart player, like it requires the smart, the thinking, it's the thinking position. And then there's like this subtle way in which that has led to, right, fewer and fewer black players taking that position over the years. And this is one of the reasons that Patrick Mahomes is so, I mean, like we see this in the way that we talk about black athletes all the time, like right, all of the rhetoric around Venus and Serena Williams being really powerful rather than about how smart they are. And like one of the things I think you're getting at in a really helpful way for me is to talk about like how fucking smart that guy is like jesus watching him is like a joy um i say this as a fan of the commanders um <laughs> but you know like yeah he's i mean he's he's not only like what are all of the reasons that someone that a black player doesn't get doesn't get that quarterback slot um and that seems to me like a huge part of why he's like this was the first super bowl where we saw um and of course everyone here everyone talking right now knows this but like for our potentially less football forward listeners like this is the first super bowl featuring a black quarterback versus a black quarterback am i right about this yeah i mean i i mentioned this earlier but there was you know a history of restricting black players from the quarterback position and if if you look back at um you know in the 60s and you know there were stories done about this you know why are there not more black quarterbacks and you know famous coaches, uh, you know, Vince Lombardi or, you know, coaches from the New York Giants or executives, you know, they would give these answers that were sort of like, well, it's not, you know, racism or it's not a racial thing. It's that, you know, they don't have the leadership skills. Um, you know, and they would say things like, you know, it's not that they, um, you know, they can't make the throws like, like we need in the NFL that I, I one, you know, football executive was quoted as saying that, you know, black quarterback, their, their movements are too loosey goosey was the word he used. Um, Which is all that, totally absurd bullshit on the level of Jimmy, the Greek saying that black people don't swim as well or float the yeah. same as white people. And, and this is all this code and shit about like, right. It's the same thing about like, how are there going to be black head coaches? Like it's the same, it's the same rhetoric. Um, and you see it across all of these sports. So, I mean, I feel like watching Patrick Mahomes, I wonder how many black quarterbacks did we not see who should have been there? And maybe how many will we see after this, who he has yeah. made a path for? I mean, we, we write about this in the book, but, you know, Patrick's father, uh, Pat Sr., who became a major league pitcher, he, he was a high school quarterback. He was a three sport athlete. He played basketball and football and was a, a, a terrific high school quarterback and was also recruited to play basketball in college. Um, but, you know, he, he was, um, you know, in an era where it, it was probably thought that, well, he's, you know, he's a, a baseball player or he's a basketball player. If he's a quarterback at the high school level, that's not even something he would, you know, necessarily pursue. I think he personally said he didn't really like being hit. Um, so he didn't love football for that reason. That's fair. Um, but his father was also, you know, a, a terrific student and, um, and was, uh, you know, Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if he was valedictorian, but he was he, some was, he was among the top students in his class. He was NHS, uh, National Honor Society. Yeah. And it's kind of a lineage like Mahomes' uh, grandfather was a valedictorian and his great uncle was a valedictorian. And uh, so it, it kind of runs in the family. So yeah, we're going to have to. Oh, go ahead. And the, well, we'll I was just wrap up say, and, and the one the one place that it really shows in football is that most of his coaches and teammates uh, we'll say he has a photographic memory that if you ask Patrick Mahomes, hey, do you remember this play, you know, from six years ago in this game, he remembers everything. Um, he sort of has a, a mind where he sort of catalogs, you know, everything he sees and can remember it with a kind of amazing recall and detail. Um, and so I think that is, you know, when you talk about, um, you know, smarts and, and football IQ is a term people use. Um, he's at the top of the game in that regard as well. 
I mean, people talk about football as being a physical game and, and being the players being meatheads. But the reason people love watching football is that the quarterbacks and receivers are processing information at an incredibly high rate to imagine all the things the defense is doing and all the different coverages and imagine the arc of the ball and where it's got to land. All that is brain processing, you know, but there's also toughness. And, and Mark, for the last story here, just because I want to glory in this for a moment, there was a story in the book about him having a broken foot in high school and playing through all the sports, which he now we learned he he is he just did in the Super Bowl with a with a high ankle sprain playing all of his games. I wonder if you could just talk about that and send us out on a high note. Uh, absolutely. So there's a little bit of debate about how broken his foot was in high school, but sometime before his senior year, he was uh, playing baseball and hurt his foot. Um, and any kind of normal kind of high school student who had at, at that time a scholarship to Texas Tech University for football, and he was considered likely to be drafted in, into the major leagues if he didn't want to play football, probably would have gotten surgery and and just chilled for like two or three months. But instead, Patrick Mahomes played that entire football season. Um, he'd sometimes walk around the hallways wearing a boot or lift weights while wearing a boot. Um, and, you know, he did Patrick Mahomes things like run all over the field and then throw the ball 50 yards, the, the same stuff we see him do today. And then, okay, so then you might think, all right, well, now maybe he'll get that surgery. But nope, um, after they lost their last game, um, roughly a week later, he was already playing basketball again uh, and still wearing that boot in the hallways. And, uh, and then he played baseball after that. So he kept on playing with this injured foot throughout his entire senior year. And he was dunking on people in basketball and uh, and just doing everything that uh, that we see him do today. So Patrick Mahomes, smarter than you are, tougher than you are, now very much richer than any of us. Uh, and now he will begin to be hated by everyone except for us here in Kansas City, which is fine. That's part of the process, I understand. But it won't be it won't be because of your book. People uh, will love reading about him in your book. Mark and Rustin, thanks so much for joining us. And we encourage our listeners to go pre-order Kingdom Quarterback, which will be out this summer. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much.